All right, so this is going to be lecture eight uh, that we're pre-recording. This is our second lecture on truss analysis. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is continuing our discussion on the method of joints. Um, so in this lecture, we're going to do uh, a truss analysis of a, um, a structure where the members have different uh, slope ratios as opposed to the previous one where they all had uh, all the diagonals were at the same slope ratio. Um, so really, uh, it's just intended to uh, sharpen our bookkeeping skills uh, and whatnot uh, and just make sure that we're comfortable with uh, handling uh, 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 members of variable slope ratio. Uh, but before we do that, um, what we're going to do is take a, a little bit of a, a, a tangent discussion and look at internal stability uh, and determinacy uh, in plane trusses. Um, so just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, just remember that um, uh, whenever we're looking at trusses, what we're looking at, uh, at uh, are structures where the members are uh, carrying only axial load. Uh, and this is uh, made possible by our three assumptions that we are not having to deal with uh, any friction or unintended forces, um, that all of the loads and support reactions are applied directly at the joint, so there's no loads on the members. Uh, and then at each joint, uh, the centroidal axes of each member coincide. Uh, and so, uh, as we've discussed in our previous lecture, that means that it, each member is carrying only axial loads. Now, um, we uh, discussed uh, on the onset that there are two primary methods for analyzing a truss. That's the method of joints and the method of sections. Um, what we're going to be doing uh, today is, again, uh, exploring the method of joints. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the bulk of our uh, focus in the course is going to be on the method of joints. Um, we'll, we'll touch on the method of sections uh, a little bit, but not uh, in heavy detail. Um, before we uh, begin our, our next example, I want to talk a little bit about uh, static uh, determinacy, um, but specifically as it relates to trusses and looking at its internal indeterminacy. Now, uh, it's been some time since we've discussed um, uh, external uh, indeterminacy, so let's, let's take a step back um, and let's make sure that we're all familiar with this. So let me move my uh, camera over here so we can all kind of see what's going on here. Um, okay, here, I'll, I'll actually I'll put it down here. Uh, okay, so let's recall that um, uh, one of our very first topics in the class was to classify a structure. And what we were trying to do was answer two questions, whether or not the structure was stable uh, and whether or not the structure was statically determinate. Um, and if you recall, um, static determinacy, or the, um, the, the, the formula that we use to uh, compute static uh, determinacy, was really just a comparison of knowns and unknowns. Uh, when we were looking externally, uh, uh, looking at the structure as a whole, um, what we were focused on is the, um, the number of unknowns being support reactions, and the number of knowns being however many equations of condition that we had plus three. And that number three uh, arose from the fact that externally we had three equations of equilibrium, the sum of forces in the x direction, the sum of forces in the y direction, and the sum of moments. The structure as a whole had to meet those three equations of equilibrium. Um, and so what we did is we compared knowns and unknowns. And for example, if those knowns uh, and unknowns were equal, then the structure should be statically determinate. Um, if we had um, uh, more unknowns than we did knowns, then we said the structure should be uh, statically indeterminate and vice versa, we said uh, the structure is unstable. And remember that term should be, there were some caveats with whether or not a structure was uh, stable. Um, just because we had an I value that was non-negative didn't guarantee stability. For a structure to be stable, um, the reactions couldn't all be concurrent and they couldn't all be parallel. Um, now, what we were looking at, and, and I, I want to be clear, what we were looking at in this assessment was external indeterminacy, the structure as a whole, seeing whether or not the structure uh, is indeed um, uh, uh, stable and determinate. Now, I'm actually going to pull up the uh, notebook uh, in the class because I, I brought up an example when we first started discussing this some time ago. Uh, and I said later on we were going to look at a structure like this. And I said that, you know, if we go back to the, the computation and the assessment of stability and determinacy, um, we can look at the structure and we can get an IE value of zero. And I, and I can show pretty easily that the structure is stable and statically determinate externally. In other words, I can compute the support reactions on the structure with just e e equations of equilibrium, no problem at all. But there's a problem that's going to arise when we start looking at internally, uh, when we start looking internally at the structure. Um, and before, we, we didn't really get into that, but now we can kind of discuss that. 
When we look at this structure, what we're going to find is that when we try and apply the method of joints, it doesn't matter which joint we start with, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have too many unknowns. Okay, Each joint has three members framing into it. And if you recall, we have a limit imposed on us um, with the method of joints. The method of joints states that because of our assumptions, we're dealing with a concurrent force system at each joint. And because of that, we can only solve joints that have at most two unknowns. So this truss is going to present a problem um, from a determinacy standpoint. Okay. Now, if I go back to my uh, presentation, what we're now going to do is we're going to look at internal indeterminacy in a truss. And so what I mean by that is external indeterminacy um, is uh, assessing whether or not we can compute the external support reactions using a solely equations of equilibrium. Internal indeterminacy is looking at whether or not we can compute the internal forces in the structure just using the equations of equilibrium. And I want to look at this truss just as the one with the, the, the one that was on the, um, the, 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 the one note, it's the same problem. Every joint has um, three unknowns and we only have two equations of equilibrium at the joint level. So if you recall in the previous expression there was this magic number three that popped up and because we were dealing with an external structure we had three equations of equilibrium. With this uh, uh, determination, there's going to be a different magic number, and the magic number is 2. Okay, Why is that? Well, again, internal indeterminacy is just a comparison of unknowns and knowns. So if we are looking at the truss as a whole, now considering what's going on inside the truss, what do we have that's unknown about a truss when we solve it? Well, we have the uh, unknown support reactions, but we also have the unknown forces in each member. And I propose there's one unknown for every member because our assumptions only allow axial force in each member. So each member has an unknown axial force and there's an unknown support reaction. So our unknowns would be, I'd say, M plus R, the number of members plus the number of reactions. That's the number of unknowns in the system. What about the number of knowns? Well, for every joint, there are two equations of equilibrium. So uh, the number of knowns, I would say, is 2j, 2 times the number of joints. Why 2? Because we only have the sum of forces in the x direction and the sum of forces in the y direction uh, that must be equal to 0. We can't deal with moments on a joint by joint basis because there are no moments uh, at a joint. So if I sub e is the external indeterminacy expression, I sub t, I'm going to say, is the internal indeterminacy of a truss. And so we can compute that as M plus R minus 2J. M being the total number of members in the system, R being the total number of unknown support reactions, and J being the total number of joints. Now, like with, um, uh, uh, with external uh, uh, indeterminacy, internal indeterminacy is much the same way that if we have a negative um, value of IT, the truss is internally unstable. If we have a non-negative value of IT, the truss should be stable. If it's zero, it's statically determinate. Uh, uh, and if it's greater than zero, it should be statically indeterminate. And where does the should be come from? Remember with external indeterminacy, there were some caveats. Well, there are some caveats with internal indeterminacy as, indeterminacy as well. So in order for a truss to be internally stable, there are two um, uh, characteristics that must be uh, uh, be maintained. Uh, the first is that if the truss is going to be internally stable, it has to be externally stable. Um, so you must have a, a non-negative IE and the truss must satisfy the conditions of external uh, stability. Uh, but the second is that the truss must be constrained against rigid body movements. And that is sometimes a, a little bit hard to uh, uh, describe uh, geometrically or mathematically, but a key giveaway that a structure is internally unstable is when you have a structure that looks like this here on the slide. So what this uh, this second bullet point is basically saying is that the, sh the truss um, uh, can't be allowed to freely displace as you'd see here uh, on the right. If we have a truss that has sort of a square region, okay, and we apply a lateral load, there's nothing really prevent it from just freely displacing. So uh, the, the best way of looking at that is a clear indicator of instability in a truss is if, if you ever have a region that sort of doesn't have any triangles. 
Um, if you have sort of open rectangular or open square regions, that's usually an indicator of, of instability. And it's something that um, for the most part never really is a problem because it is incredibly rare that we would have trust systems without triangles just because of the, the nature of the, the systems that we're generating. Um, so I, I doubt that we're really going to have very many problems where a trust would be um, unstable in this fashion, nor do I think uh, you'll see very many <laughs> examples of a trust like this built in the real world. So it's just worth mentioning, but it, it usually isn't too much of a major concern. Okay, so this is going to be the, I'm going to move my camera back up here. Um, so this is going to be the example uh, that we focus on today, and I'm going to actually go ahead and jump right to the notebook because we can go ahead and get fired up. Um, let me go back to the problem in question. Example two. Make this full screen. Um, uh, actually, let me uh, pop my camera down a little bit. Um, so I have here that we're going to determine the internal uh, member forces of this plane truss using the method of joints. Um, the first thing I want to point out, and then I'll move my camera back up, is what's going up uh, here on the top right. What I went ahead and, and did is I uh, did a quick uh, assessment of the um, stability and determinacy of the system. Um, first off, if we just use the raw expression, uh, you can count it up and there are a total of 21 members in the structure. Um, and there are three support reactions and there are a total of 12 joints. So if you compute M plus R minus 2J, you will get a, an IT value of zero. Um, and you can see in the structure there really isn't uh, a, a section that has uh, an absence of triangles um, and, and uh, it, it can pretty easily be borne out that this structure is stable and statically determinate. Um, so I went ahead and did this calculation. There are going to be um, two homework problems where you have to compute IT. It's fairly plug and chug, so it's, there's not really a lot uh, of effort that goes into it. I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, okay, I'll move my camera back up here. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this structure utilizing the method of joints. Now, this truss is um, a little bit more involved from a, a geometric perspective than our last one, but there's something that this truss is exhibiting, which our previous example did not, and that is symmetry. Okay, um, This truss is symmetric both with respect to its geometry and with respect to its loading. So, in other words, I could literally draw a line going right like this and I could fold the like if this was on a sheet of paper I could fold the truss about that line and it would be the same image on, on either side. Um, what that means is that when I'm analyzing this structure um, I can solve from one end let's say I start at joint A and I can solve until I get to the middle of the structure and then stop because the results will be reflected based on symmetry. So for example whatever force I get in member AB it's going to be the same force I get in member FG. Because again, not only is the truss symmetric with respect to geometry, but also loading. So that principle, so first off, to be clear, that principle wouldn't hold if I got rid of one of these loads, like the load at K, if I just deleted that, then I would have to analyze the entire structure. Okay, um, But I am including a truss that is symmetric with respect to geometry and loading because it is fairly common in the real world. Um, that's not to say that's always the case, but usually engineers try and exhibit symmetry when they can. Um, and it, this is this would be an example of a structure that um, and you know that, that we would try and employ in the real world. Um, so I, I just want to, to throw that out there that if you have symmetry with respect to geometry, boundary conditions and loading, uh, that it can make your life a, a lot easier from an analysis standpoint. Uh, and again, uh, the support reactions have already been computed. Even if uh, I didn't give you the support reactions on this problem, I think it would be pretty easy. There's a total of 30 kips going down. Everything's symmetric, so 15 on each side. Uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and, and, and get right into it. Um, and I'm going to try and um, approach this the same way uh, as I have uh, my previous problems. Now, um, I'll, I'll um, level with you that I'm actually recording this lecture. Uh, whoop, sorry. I'm recording this lecture before lecture seven, so um, we're actually giving this lecture tomorrow in class. So um, I'll uh, what I'll do is I'll try and do that example the same way I'm doing this one. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that we'll want to do 
is maybe try and develop a strategy before we begin the structure. And we'll talk about this in class in lecture seven, which for you will be um, before you watch this video. Uh, but um, the, the first thing I like to do when we're doing a trust analysis is try and develop a strategy so I'm not just blindly picking uh, joints. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll have a section called order of analysis. Um, Okay, uh, and so what I mean by that is, let's just say that the first joint that we are going to analyze is joint A, okay? And I think that's a pretty fair uh, uh, place to start because if I use my highlighter here, joint A only has two members framing into it. So once I solve joint A, those are gonna be the members that I have solved for at the end of the day. Um, well, then my question after that is, which joint should I do after joint A? Um, should I solve joint B? I would say the answer to that is no. Because if, if let's say I've solved joint A, if I go to joint B, I'm gonna have one, two, three unknowns, right? So this is an unknown, that's an unknown, that's an unknown, framing into joint B. So solving joint B next wouldn't help me out, okay? Instead, I propose that what I need to do is solve joint H next because joint H is only going to have two unknowns, the BH and the HI. So that will give me this member and this member. Okay. So after that, I will then go ahead and solve joint B. Joint B will give me this member and this member, because again, two unknowns. Okay, and what do I do from there? Let's do joint I. Joint I will give me this member and this member. And then maybe what I'll do is joint C. Joint C will give me this member and this member. And then from there, I, uh, so I guess theoretically I have a choice. Um, you know, uh, one thing you might think is could I go ahead and solve joint J? Well, the answer is yes if I recognize symmetry. Because uh, remember, for every member that I solve on the left side of the truss, I am solving a member on the right side of the truss uh, as well. So if I s get to this point in the structure, I'll theoretically know what's going on in these diagonal members right here. So I could go ahead and solve joint J, but to be honest, I'm kind of lazy and I don't really want to draw all those uh, forces. There's the load at J, there's all those diagonals. So I'll just keep things simple and solve for joint D. Um, and then joint D will basically give me that vertical member right here. And then at that point, it, it'll be over, okay? Um, it'll be over. So I'm actually gonna take a little note right here because uh, we're gonna do this problem on the fly and we will, um, I didn't even bring my calculations home with me. We're just gonna do it together. So what we're gonna do is we are going to get started and I'm going to do this and we are going to go right to joint A. So let's do joint A. So whenever we're looking at, um, so whenever we're looking at this, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by drawing the joint. So let's draw the joint. We have a member like this and a member like this. So that's our joint. Um, I like to use red for all of the known forces. So this is 15 kips, okay? Um, we have a uh, diagonal member and a horizontal member. So the horizontal member is gonna have one unknown component, and then we have a vertical and a horizontal right here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and name those, so we'll call this A-H-Y, we'll call this A-H-X, we'll call this A-B. Okay, and so all I'm doing is I'm just going back to the truss here and I'm saying, okay, so we have AH, so we split that up into X and Y components, and then I have AB um, just with the horizontal component. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my slope ratio. Okay, uh, this is something I sort of, I didn't really get into major detail on, so uh, let's go ahead and, and do that now. Uh, if it's okay, I'm going to erase all these highlights here because um, right now I just kind of want to focus on the slope ratios. So the main sort of purpose of this problem is that we have diagonals of different slope ratios. So I'm gonna focus on the left side and just make sure that we're all comfortable 
with the slope ratios for each of these diagonals. And let's start off with AH. So AH, let's look at the diagonal. It goes from A to H, I go to the right a total of 12 feet, and I go up a total of 6 feet. So this is a 6 to 12 or a 1 to 2 slope ratio. So we'll do 1 to 2. And that's going to be the case for that entire upper uh, diagonal. So this is going to be 1 to 2, and this is going to be 1 to 2. Um, now, let's look at this BI. So BI, what do we do? From left to right, we go over a distance of 12 feet, because that's all that's saying right there. Is that's just, there's six, ga or six segments, and each one's 12 foot long. And then from B to I, we go up. 6 feet, 6 feet, 12 feet. So we go 1 to 1 over 12, up 12. As for this CJ member, we go over 12 and then we go up 6, 12, 18. So over 12, up 18 or over 2, up 3. Okay. So I think that should be pretty straightforward. So, so my point about that is when we go to joint A, this is going to be 2 to 1. So we're going to put that 2 to 1 right there. Okay. So now we've got a joint uh, to analyze. So uh, make things simple. So we have two unknown vertical components. Or sorry, two unknown horizontal components. Two unknown horizontals. One unknown vertical. So I'm going to sum forces in the y direction. And what that tells me is if I have 15 kips going up, then AHY has to be 15 kips going down. So that is going down like that. Uh, and then the slope ratio tells me that if this is going down, then this... So first off, you know, uh, I, I said slope ratio, but the direction indicates that e either both areas have to be facing toward the joint or both areas have to be facing away from the joint. In this case, they're both facing towards the joint. And the slope ratio, what that tells me is that AHY is to 1 as AHX is to 2, or AH x is 2ahy or 30 kips to the left right all it's saying is if you look at my slope ratio i have a one on the vertical a two on the horizontal so the bigger number needs to be um uh, uh, on the horizontal and we're not using the hypotenuse here because all we're doing is comparing the vertical leg to the horizontal leg the hypotenuse would ever only come into place if we wanted the resultant but we can figure out the resultant with a, a, an easier approach um, now the last thing that we need to do is we need to employ our other equation of equilibrium uh, and so if we have 30 to the left then a b has to be 30 to the right And there's the, st the statics are done. The only thing left to do is to just come up with a quick joint summary. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? So for AB, what I'm really interested in is I'm interested in a magnitude and a quote unquote direction. And what I mean by that for the member is I wanna know whether or not that member is experiencing tension or compression. AB is a force that is facing away from the joint. So this is in tension. Uh, and for AH, um, we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna apply the Pythagorean theorem. So we have AH x squared plus AH y squared. This is a, uh, sorry, this is 30 kips squared plus 15 kips squared. And so when I plug and chug, again, like I said, I didn't bring my calculation or my, my notes with me today, so we're just going to do this together. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm getting 33.54 kips. And then um, as for the direction, um, so that's going to be towards the joint, so that's going to be in compression. Uh, and there we go, that, that's basically it. Um, so I'm just gonna take a little note here off to the side. So AB is 30 kips in compression and AH is 33.5, or sorry, in tension. Uh, four kips in compression uh, and there we go so that's that's this joint and so we just repeat okay so our next joint is going to be joint H remember we already figured out uh, our order of operations so we don't really need to get uh, too inventive there so we're gonna do joint H okay so whenever you're doing a joint again first thing you do draw the joint out so joint H looks like that and there is a six kip load applied to joint H uh, and um, I have here a, another image of the truss here in front of me I mean I'm trying to re reduce the amount of scrolling up and down but just to make sure for this one that everybody's on the same page so what I'm drawing is I'm drawing that joint right there so we've got the two members the vertical and then the six kips. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I probably won't scroll back up and down anymore, but it's YouTube, you can rewind uh, as needed. Okay, so here's our member. Um, we already identified that these are both um, one to two slope ratios. So I'll go ahead and indicate that. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and recognize that I actually already know this one and this one. Now, um, the best way of remembering that is, is to name them, okay? So what would be the name of this? Well, this would be A-H-Y. Actually, let me, let me, take, let me do this a little, little slower. So here's our element. So let's call this A-H-Y-A-H-X, okay? Now let's do this slower. Now, whenever you're drawing a free body diagram and you're looking at a force, you need magnitude and direction. Now, the magnitudes, I usually think students don't have a problem with that as long as you're naming things correctly because, you know, what did we solve before? We got this was 30 kips and we got this was 15 kips. And I just pulled that from up there. So those are pretty easy to figure out. Here, I'll um, take this one and sort of move it over. So I got some wiggle room here. But the directions, the directions is uh, is usually the part that students tend to mess up. And it, it's just because uh, as you're going through a trust analysis, sometimes the bookkeeping, you gotta make sure that you're uh, paying attention to what's going on. And the, the most important thing to focus on is what's going on in member AH. Member AH is experiencing compression. So it doesn't matter whether you're looking at this joint or this joint, the member is experiencing compression. And compression is always true when the arrows face the joint. Now, what gets confusing sometimes is that if you look at the previous joint, so here we have, for example, AHX is 30 kips to the right, but up here we got AHX was 30 kips to the left. You can see that up here. Um, and that's just, you know, equal and opposite, looking at the other end of the joint. I usually find it's easier to just Think about it from a magnitude and direction standpoint. So magnitude, 30 on the horizontal, 15 on the vertical. And as for direction, just look at whether or not it's in tension or compression. And if it's in compression, draw the arrows facing the joint. If it's in tension, draw the arrows facing away from the joint. I find that is usually the easier way uh, of going about it. Okay, so now for our unknowns, we have an unknown here, an unknown here, and an unknown here. So again, the first thing I'll do is I'll name them. So we're gonna call this BH. Uh, and this uh, uh, upper diagonal is HI, so we'll call this HIY. And this is HIX, okay? Uh, so now what we'll do is we'll apply our equations of equilibrium. Now with this, I've got two 
vertical unknowns, but only one horizontal unknown. So I'm actually going to solve uh, some forces in the x direction first. Okay, and if I look at my free body diagram, what are my known forces? Well, the 15 kip vertical, the 6 kip vertical, I could ignore that. The only thing I have is 30 going to the right. So HIX has to be 30 kips to the left. So this is facing like that. Okay. Uh, and next, whenever you solve for one component of a diagonal, immediately solve for the next using the slope ratio of the member. So just like before, we have the horizontal component is to 2 as, oh, getting ahead of myself, the vertical component is to 1, so therefore HIY is just 1 half of HIX or 15 kips. And as for the direction, HIX is facing towards the joint, HIY towards the joint uh, as well. So this is 15 kips down. Okay. Uh, and then the only thing left to do from there is to apply uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction. Um, if you think it's necessary, um, if you ever have a joint where you feel like you got a lot going on, um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing it formally uh, and saying, okay, I have, you know, AHY, which is 15 kips going up. I have six kips going down. I have HIY, which is 15 kips going down. So I need to, what do I need to balance that with? Well, I've got 21 kips going down. I need 21 kips going up. So maybe BH needs to go over here. And then BH plus 15 kips is 21 kips or um, BH is six kips, which is six kips going up, all right? So if you need to do that, uh, you can. There's nothing saying you can't. Um, I usually don't do that unless I've got a lot of verticals uh, or a lot of forces to deal with, um, but it, it, it's an option for you, all right? Now, uh, again, I, I usually kind of like putting a little joint summary here. So joint summary. So we have member BH, which is experiencing six kips. That six kips towards the joint is compression. And then HI, we got to break out the Pythagorean theorem. Here, I'm going to scroll that up a little bit so I don't have to keep crunch, uh, crunching my hand. which is and this one it, it's actually going to numerically come out the same as it did before so we'll call this 33.54 uh, kips in compression okay so we're rocking and rolling and I'm going to um, make note of these, so just make sure I, uh, I don't forget my answers. Okay. Um, and so we already agreed, again, on our joint analysis. So our joint analysis, we had, let's see, joint A, B, H, I, C, D. So we're going to go to joint B. And again, if you need to go back and remember what the truss looked like, you go right ahead. I'm just going to go off of what I got here. So joint B, we have, we'll say we'll put the joint right here. We have a horizontal member, a vertical member, uh, a horizontal member. Now there are no forces being applied to the joint, but we do have some unknown internals. So we've got this right here. 
So let's look at that. That's going to be force AB, right? Because force AB, so this is joint B, to the left is joint A. We already solved for that. We got 30 kips. And as for the direction, that's in tension. I have AB as 30 kips in tension. So that's going to be pointing away from the joint. Okay. Now this vertical one right here. Oh, I forgot a member. I need a member right here. I'm going to go back to that member here in a bit. Okay, so we have a vertical. We have a vertical right here. That vertical is going to be BH. BH is six kips. Um, and that's in, let's see, compression. So that's going to go down. All right, so we've got a vertical here, a horizontal here, and this here. So let's name them. So this is going to be BI y b i x and that's going to be b c um, the only thing left to do is apply our slope ratio and this is another area where it's really easy to uh, have a bookkeeping issue because this is one to one okay it's one to one because we're not looking at this i'm, I'm i said i wasn't going to scroll anymore but here i am uh, so we're looking at you know, that joint right there and that member is at a one to one slope ratio, not a one to two. OK, so make sure that, you know, you're just being cognizant uh, of your bookkeeping here. All right. So let's see um, if I so let's see, we've got two uh, horizontals, one vertical. So some forces in the y direction. So B, I, Y, if I've got six down, I got to have six kips up going up. That's going to be up. If that's to going upward, then this uh, for the diagonal, then the horizontal has to go that way. Um, let's do it like that. And then the slope ratio. This one's pretty easy. They're one to one. So if the vertical six kips, the horizontal is six kips. So B I X is six kips in this case to the right. Um, and let's see, as for the um, the horizontal, so what do I got? I got 30 kips to the left. I've got six to the right. So let's see. Got to be 24 kips to the right. So do a joint summary. So joint summary tells me that, let's see, BC is 24 kips in tension, because it's away from the joint. Uh, and BI is also going to be in tension. Break out the old Pythagorean theorem. So. So I've got 8.49, and we'll call that tension. So let me write these down here. Okay. Just rock and rolling. So. Again, we already figured out our order of operations. So joint A, joint H, joint B, joint I. Joint I is next. This is definitely one of those videos probably that you could play at 1.25 speed uh, in certain places. Okay, so joint I is a little busy. There's a lot going on here. Um, so let's see. So we've got, let's draw this one kind of big. So we've got a member like this, but then we have a vertical and another diagonal like that. So we got a lot going on here, okay? Um, let's also not forget we have a six kip load right here. So 
Again, just watch what you're looking at right here. Okay, now let's start at the left and sort of work our way over. So this is gonna be HI. Now HI, we already have solved, this one right here. So we have HIX, that's gonna be 30 kips. HIY, 15 kips. And I'm gonna take that HIY I'm going to move that over a little bit because I want to have myself some room. Now HI is experiencing compression. So compression, compression. Okay, so that's HI. Okay, now this diagonal here, that's going to be, I believe, uh, BI. Uh, and so BI has, BI is in tension. Uh, and so... Uh, and this is six kips, B, I, Y, six kips. Okay, let me, let me uh, redo that a bit. And I'm even also, I'm gonna move that over. Yeah, wanna give myself some room, okay. So we have a diagonal, which is at a one to two. We have an unknown here, an unknown here, and an unknown here. And again, I kind of like to name those. So we're referencing the structure. This is CI. This is going to be I, J, um, Y, and I, J, X. Okay. Uh, and we're nearing the end of the structure, so so this one's probably one of our more involved joints, but hopefully one of the latter ones uh, in terms of complexity. So which should we solve first? We have two verticals, one horizontal. Deal with the X component first. Uh, and let's see, so I've got 30 going to the right. I have six going to the left. Um, so I need another... 24, in this case, going that way, because HIX is 30, so 6 makes that another 24. Uh, the slope ratio is also pretty nice. So instead of writing out the fraction and doing the cross multiplication, I think I'm just going to uh, eyeball it and see that IJY has got to be 1 over 2 of IJX. The vertical component's got to be the smaller one, so it's 1 over 2, not 2 over 1. And that's going to be 12 kips, in this case, going down, because that's going to be facing that way. That's going to be facing that way. So again, compression. All right, sum of verticals. This one might be a little trickier. You might want to um, draw yourself out a little table. Um, let's see if I can eyeball it. So um, what do I have going down? Okay, so I've got BIY, which is six kips. I've got this here, so let, let's use my highlighter. What do I have going down? Six kips, six kips, and 12 kips. So I got 24 kips going down. Um, what do I have going up? I have 15 kips going up. So that means that CI, I need another nine kips going up. So. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, um, you can always just, again, write out the table. Um, the more you uh, uh, do this, the, the, the more comfortable you get um, you know, with doing that. Again, as you get to your last joint, sort of the equilibrium kind of figures itself out. So we're going to go with um, our summary here. So CI is nine kips in compression. And then IJ is, so we have IJ X squared plus IJ Y squared. Um, and so this is, uh, actually I'm doing that backwards. Not that that really matters, but. Um, and let's see. Got 
Okay, so I'm getting 26.83. And let's see, IJ is in compression. Okay. All right, so we are rocking and rolling. All right, so our next joint is joint C. And um, as I'm solving this out, one thing I'll say is if you're ever in the, you know, in a lecture like this or watching a lecture like this, and you get to the point where these problems are boring you, you know, you say, oh, I get it. How many different, like, I, I can do these joints. Then that means you're learning it. You know, that's a good thing. Because um, it, if it's so easy that you're, you're, you're having a hard time, you know, you know, it's so easy that you're having a hard time, I don't want to say paying attention, like I hope I'm not boring you, but um, I, again, you, you want this to sort of be routine. You want this to feel like it's routine. Okay, so here's joint C. Okay, so, so BC is 24 kips. Now BC uh, was in um, tension, so I'm going to point that like that. And, you know, I'm looking at it in tension, so it's pointing to the left. But again, from a bookkeeping standpoint, if you go back to when we solved BC up here, I had BC pointing to the right. So whenever you draw that again, equal magnitude, opposite direction. Okay. Now this vertical, this vertical we've solved, this is CI. CI we solved for, it's uh, nine kips and it is compression, so it's pointing down. And again, the last time we drew CI, it was nine kips going up, equal magnitude, opposite direction. Now we've got this and this and this. I like to name these, so let's name them. Let's call this CD. And we've got CJ, uh, Y, CJ, X. And as for our slope ratio, this is the only one that's kind of different. This is a three to two. Okay, that's, uh, that's, this is the only, or it's not the only one that's different. This is the only uh, three to two slope ratio uh, uh, member that we'll deal with uh, in this example. Because after this, we'll be able to exploit symmetry, look at the end, and, and we'll be done. Okay, so two horizontals, one vertical, which means I'm summing for the some of the forces in the y direction first. And so I've got nine kips down, tells me I gotta have nine kips going up. Okay, um, and then the slope ratio. Okay. So what I'll say is I'm, oh, I, whoops, I got ahead of myself. I needed to say up here, this is CJ, Y is nine kips up. And then let's actually draw that arrow. Okay, proper bookkeeping. Okay, now um, whenever you're looking at this, so I need to solve for CJ, X, and I need to solve it as, cjy times some fraction and so is the fraction going to be two-thirds or is the fraction going to be three halves and the best way of looking at that is to look at your slope ratio the horizontal component is smaller than the vertical component so this fraction needs to result in a smaller answer it needs to be two-thirds not three halves uh, and two-thirds of nine kips i think i can do that one in my head that's six kips that's going to be six kips this way Okay, so there's that. Some of the forces in the x direction. Um, some of the forces in the x direction tells me that I've got 24 kips acting to the left. I have six kips acting to the right. So CD needs to be 18 kips to the right in order to balance everything out. So joint summary.
So joint summary, what do we got going on? So CD, let me put my little arrow here on the free body, is oh, uh, CD, um, is going to be 18 kips. And as for its magnitude, it's pointing away from the joint. Um, so that's going to be in, um, oh, goodness, what happened there? Uh, that's going to be in tension. Uh, and then CJ is going to be solved using the Pythagorean theorem. Whew. So. Do better than that. Okay. Uh, all right, so. Okay, and so I'm getting ten point eight two kips, uh, and then these were pointing away from the joint, so they are also in tension. Okay. Now. Our last joint is joint D, uh, and joint D is going to have a very interesting result, okay? Because if you follow joint D, so here's joint D. It's the one that's in the middle of the truss, okay? Now, what we know from what we just solved is, and let me write these. I'm actually going to write these results down. From the last joint okay so what we solved from our last joint we know that this is cd which is 18 kips in tension now here's the joint okay um up until now i really haven't exploited symmetry um but the symmetry part isn't really going to matter with my initial observation with with what i'm observing with this joint so I've got an unknown here and here. Let's name those. So this is going to be DE, uh, and this one's going to be DJ. Now, DE doesn't really matter from a problem solution standpoint because the structure is symmetric. I, I could have figured out DE without even looking at this joint because the structure is symmetric. But even if I look at the joint, I can see, okay, let's sum forces in the X direction. If I sum forces in the X direction, I'm getting that DE is 18 kips you know, to the right. But I kind of knew that was going to be the case. CD was 18 kips in tension, so DE is 18 kips in tension. That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the vertical member. Because here's the joint. There are no loads applied at joint D. So all I have is a two horizontal members and one vertical member framing into that joint. There are no vertical forces on that joint. So if I sum forces in the Y direction, the question is, what is DJ? And the answer is DJ is zero. It is not a member that is experiencing compression or a member that is experiencing tension. It is a zero force member. It is not carrying any load at all. And that happens with some truss analyses. Um, and so um, this is, I think, our first uh, in-class example with a zero force member. We're going to talk about this during lecture nine, how to identify zero force members, because they do happen um, and there are reasons for them. And I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole discussing that, all I'll say is that zero force members do happen. Okay, so therefore joint summary DJ is zero. Now, um, as I'll mention in class, or as, as I mentioned, um, I do want to see an analysis summary um, at the very end. And this summary is our answer. Uh, and the way that I draw that is I draw it as a free body diagram. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of draw it like this. Um, and I'm gonna draw this. And so I've got, you know, this member 
this member, this member, and then I've got this, and then I got this. Um, I can do that last one a little better. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of like do that and that and that and I'll I'll just um, I'll basically just sort of do that and just say symmetric about and then I'll use that symbol to indicate center line uh, and then I'll just start writing my forces now the way I'm going to do that is I'll start off I'm going to write everything I'm going to say uh, let's sort of say these are my joints. Um, so let's put our forces here. So this is six kips, six kips, six kips, and then this 15 kips. And now let's just start writing them out. So, oh, it would probably help me a B, C, D, um, and then this is H, I, J. Okay, so now it's just a matter of transcribing. So 30 kips tension, B, C, 24 kips tension, C, D, 18 kips tension, A, H, 33.54 kips compression HI 33.54 kips uh, compression IJ 26.83 kips in compression sometimes it's a little easier as you're uh, doing these problems to actually write these out as you're doing it like have a little truss drawn off to the side um, and then as you solve from joint to joint, literally transcribe it here so you don't have to do it all at the very end. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's see, BH. So we'll draw that like that. Six kips. Compression. Uh, this CI nine kips. Compression. And then the way that I, I uh, indicate zero force members uh, is I just do that to indicate that it's zero and then this that's your answer now this video is going a little long and I am apologize my apologies for that um, but uh, one thing I will say is if you're ever unsure about your results pick a joint like joint J and check the equilibrium on joint J because we now have the entire structure solved. Just actually draw a free body diagram of joint J. Take the X and Y components of each of those forces and draw it there. And you will see that it is uh, in equilibrium. I'll post that uh, below. I won't make the video go any longer than it already has. My apologies, it's gone a little over. Um, uh, but with that, that's all I've got in this lecture and I will see you all uh, next time.